and that's gonna produce this um, methoxide, okay? Which is kind of like a hydroxide, but you have a methyl group on there, okay? So this is one way of writing it. Another way of writing it might be like this, just to indicate a methyl group there. So hopefully we have enough real estate to do this. So we'll have a methoxide. That's, that's, really, what we're that's really what's being catalyzed. They're really speeding up methoxide formation. And so when you speed up methoxide formation by having more collisions with hydroxyl ions by being in low pH, high potassium hydroxide conditions, now we have more of these collisions, where these electrons in this, um, in this methoxide can attack the backside of that carbonyl. Because remember, on your periodic table, where oxygen is in terms of electronegativity, it's much more electronegative than carbon, and it's going to be greedy. It's going to pull those electrons away from carbon. Carbon's going to be slightly positive. The oxygen's going to be slightly negative. This, these strongly negative you know, electron pair on the methoxy are going to go right into there electrostatically and attack that site, that electrostatic attraction, and boom, you have chemistry. Okay? And when you do so, then um, this guy, these electrons here in this double bond can pick up a proton. You might say, where are the protons lying around this high pH condition? Well, they're there. There's protons still. They're not completely excluded from the party. And now, now you're going to have this intermediate, which is much easier to draw, given that I'm abbreviating everything as R groups. Okay? So now you have this tetrahedral structure with an R group from your linoleic acid and this new invading methyl group from the methanol. Now, this species is not stable, so it's going to resolve itself. The electrons are going to come back off. That, this proton is going to dissociate here. And, um, and then these electrons are going to pick up a proton. So now we will have done some bond cleavage here and we will have released one fatty acid, okay? We'll release one fatty acid from the triglyceride and we made one new biodiesel, or methyl linoleate to be exact. So there's our methyl linoleate, um, sorry, a little dyslexia there, biodiesel. And we also, you know, in order to finish out this chemistry though, you know, I'm just gonna abbreviate this dramatically, we have to do 2x more um, transesterifications. Okay? We have to do two X more transesterifications, and once we do that, then we will have done this. We'll have three methyl ester products. Okay? So this is your glycerol. And those are your three methyl linoleates. All right. So as you can see in this uh, particular um, uh, reaction, um, as you can see in this particular reaction, uh, uh, yeah, we've, we've now just basically just swapped, we swapped the methanol alcohol group for each of the alcohol groups in the glycerol. And that's why it's called a transesterification. So the other mechanism you know, why, you might ask, well, why might you do this? So we just talked about base catalysis. We talked about base catalysis. You might say, well, why would we want to do an acid catalysis? So these are two different mechanisms. Now, there's a third mechanism, which we're not going to do, um, but I'll put it up there. You can do enzyme. An enzyme is a biological molecule, a protein, and you can do enzyme catalysis. There are enzymes called lipases that are responsible for cleaving fats, like fatty acid, uh, 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 these fatty acid esters like triglycerides. So you can use one of those and throw in methanol or ethanol or whatever. You want to do your transesterification. Do transesterification on the enzyme. So you might say, what are the pros and cons? the pros and cons of these mechanisms. Uh, you know, let's assume that all of them work, which they all do. Um, it turns out that the big pro for base catalysis is that base, base catalysis is 4,000 times faster than acid. Now, I'm not going to give you any relative pros and cons here for uh, the enzyme method because I didn't look into it too carefully. I have one, but I don't know exactly in terms of speed whether it is as fast as base or not. So I can't tell you in terms of speed whether enzyme is faster. So you might say, well, why would you ever want to use acid catalysis? Well, acid catalysis has a great benefit. It, it, it's, not, it's not inhibited. Um, or poison, basically. The reaction is really poisoned um, by what we call free fatty acids. Because, you know, oils uh, are typically recycled from, you know, say, uh, potato chip factories and things like that, um, there'll be free fatty acids in there. And free fatty acids are going to form what we call soap with uh, potassium hydroxide. And soap uh, forms a white uh, uh, precipitates all over the machinery. It clogs it up. Okay, so when you do this base hydrolysis, you have lots of free fatty acids. They're forming soaps and they're really gumming it up. But acid catalysis doesn't care about free fatty acids. In fact, acid catalysis will convert through another reaction called esterification the free fatty acids into esters, okay, which are biodiesels. And that will work out well for you. So um, acid catalysis is not inhibited by free fatty acids like base, and, and it can use FFAs, free fatty acids, to, um, make, to make biodiesel um, by esterification. And we're not going to show the esterification reaction. I'm just trying to give you, you know, somewhat of a real-world understanding of why chemistry happens the way it does in industrial processes, why people make, people make business decisions based on yield and based on um, damage to the equipment or, re, you know, recyclability of certain materials. And maybe if you're using virgin soybean oil, you might want to do more base catalysis. But if you're using a lot of recycled cooking oils, you may want to investigate acid catalysis because recycled cooking oils have that contaminant. Um, in terms of enzyme catalysis, lipases, a big advantage is, you know, um, for enzymes is room temperature. You know, enzymes, enzymes are active there. So I should have wrote enzymes are active at in front of the sentence here, but you know, to save time, I'm just going to do that. So enzymes are active at room temperature, so you have to heat up your reaction. So when you heat up a big reaction vessel, you know, you're investing energy in that process. And if your goal is to make energy, uh, transform energy really, into this biodiesel molecule, but you have to heat it up, you're basically having to use joules to heat it up, your ultimate yield of you know, transforming some initial soybean oil into biodiesel goes down. So you know, there, there may be a big advantage here to using enzymes. But uh, anyway, that's some, some thinking there. So the acid catalysis mechanism, we're not going to do the enzyme, but we'll think about acid here. The big difference in this mechanism is you have a lot of protons floating around when you're under acidic conditions. And so you'll have your triglyceride, and your triglyceride can now be protonated.
Okay, so now we can have protons coming into the equation. And we can protonate this guy. And one of the key uh, spots for protonation occurs here. Now, when we have three bonds to oxygen like that, we're going to have a positive charge. Remember, for your lab exam, how to compute formal charges. And so that's, um, that's our intermediate. And with this intermediate, I'll just make a note there. There's three bonds to oxygen, so it's positively charged. And so now our methanol can come in. And methanol has these unpaired electrons. And they like the situation. They can come in and um, react. So now you'll have um, the following intermediate, which is unstable again, and we'll want to resolve to a methyl ester. Give myself a little room. So again, we have this intermediate, OK? Uh, you know, I moved that, you know, I, I lost that, that charged proton in the process there. Um, but uh, I'm sorry, I, I lost the charge on the oxygen, on the carbonyl that we attacked in that process. I said that wrong. So now, now these electrons can come back in, and we can resolve this product, OK? Pick up a proton. There's plenty of protons to pick up under acidic conditions in this reaction. So it's a pretty straightforward um, reaction. This will give you good practice for organic chemistry coming up. You will have hit the ground running if you understand this. And we will have made a biodiesel. Granted, I'm going to draw it backwards. I hope that doesn't bother too many people in the way I've been drawing before. But remember, it's the same either direction here. And here's your methyl linoleic. OK, your biodiesel. All right, so that's the acid catalyzed mechanism. Were there any questions on this? What? Question? No? Uh, why would the electrons attra attack the carbonyl? Yeah, well, again, again um, it's an electronegativity issue. So you have, uh, you have a nice partial negative here, and you have a, nice, you have a partial positive here. And so it's a good site. All right. Yes? Can you say that louder? So number three for the pros and cons, is that what you're asking about? What, what's your question? Yeah, enzymes are active at room temperature. So that's an advantage for uh, enzyme catalyzed glyphases. You don't have to heat up the vat. Um, as you do, because when we do this base catalyzer reaction, it needs a heat plate, right? If you guys looked ahead in your lab notebook. So you're going to, you know, those processes, uh, those base acid catalyzed reactions are much more, much more favorable, have much faster kinetics at higher temperatures. The big advantage of enzymes, the reason I'm standing here and I don't have to be like heated up to like 250 degrees Celsius, is that I'm made of enzymes. So are you. And so all my reactions are happening at basically body temperature. Now, mammals have some advantage over reptiles because we're a little bit warmer body temperature wise. And so for reptiles, they feel good to hang out in the sun. Um, they can do more reactions that way. Um, all right. So that's a big advantage of enzymes, uh, you know, nice catalysis uh, at room temperature. Ecotoxicity. Now, I spent a lot of time talking about this already at the beginning. We can be very formal now. We can say it's the potential for you know, a chemical or biological or physical stressor um, uh, you know, to affect the ecosystem. So, so that's ecotoxicity. Um, it, might not, it might be a little bit more than potential. It might be, you know, more, um, it's potential. So that is ecotoxicity. Once it's happened, of course, there's no potential about it. Um, but uh, we, we'd like to just make rational decisions being um, human beings and try to be stewards of the environment, what products we should make and what ones we shouldn't make based on their potential for harm. That's a great idea, right? So um, the stressors the stressors could disrupt when introduced into the environment various things. For example, natural populations. So natural populations. What else? Life cycles. But you might say ultimately life cycles could affect natural populations. We'll just keep it separate. And behavior. You might say also, well, behavior could also affect natural populations. But one might, you know, if one might be investigating an environmental situation, maybe the best thing to do is look first at behavior. Like, I have an industrial waste pond, and ducks don't want to use it. And it might be something toxic in an industrial waste pond. Could be. You might investigate it based on behavior. Anyway, um, that is ecotoxicity in a nutshell. And so this um, lethal dose, this 50% lethal dose, or LD50, we said, is measured in something like some sort of units of mass. The units are some sort of mass of a, say, chemical, um, of a toxin. It's biological. Of course, you say biological toxin, of course, is ultimately chemical anyway, divided by the mass of the subject. And the subject here could be um, you know, a worm, a fish, a frog, um, rat, mouse. Um, in your case, a radish seed. And you'll see whether you get germination, which is your indication that that seed's still alive, and whether that's alive or not. That would be your way of uh, estimating lethal dose in your laboratory experiment. So this still might seem like an opaque subject until you graph it. And I always find that graphing something makes it much clearer. So here on this axis is what we call survival. So 100% survival of a population, then somewhere in the middle is 50%, and then no survivors here. And we can plot that against milligrams of toxin per kilogram of subject. Now, you know, this is based on using a very standardized set of animals that all weigh about the same. You can sort of get away with this normalization at this point. And so what would happen is that you, know, you had zero, no toxin added, say 25 milligrams, say 50 milligrams. I mean, I'm just making up the units here um, in this particular graph. This, by the way, wouldn't be too terribly toxic, somewhat toxic, but not extremely. And you might get a curve that looks something like this. And so where is the LD50 on this curve? Well, you just come over here for 50% survival. And I'm sorry, my 50% survival line is a little bit high on this 
drawing here. And then you go down on your curve, and you find out where here this is, this concentration. I don't know what we'll call this. We'll call this, say, 65. This is the LD50, about, say, 65 milligrams of this toxin per kilogram of subject. Um, and that is LD50. So I want to leave the last minutes of class here to do a quicker question. It'll be an LD50 calculation. So I hope you were thinking hard about it. Oh, that was tragic. No one saw that, right? OK, good. I was worried. OK, so it's a good, good question to think about here. But we, we have, in this case, a toxin where 10 micrograms of this toxin can kill 50% of a population of half kilogram sized rats. But I want to know the LD50 value in units of micrograms of toxin per kilogram of rat. So this is a unit conversion question, ultimately, but um, the kind of question you might see on the exam. So click in, and hopefully I'll have enough time to um, go over the answer before you have to leave for your next class. So for those of you that aren't surprised, you simply divide the, the number of micrograms of the toxin by the weight of the rats in the population. Now, if you're given a real sort of data set, the rats might weigh different amounts. And so you'd have to find out you know, exactly what the average mass was before you did the calculation. That'd be a little bit of a wrinkle in that question.